Good morning. It's good to see this number out. I hope you all are as excited as I am. Norm had to hold me back. I know that uh, Todd said we was going to sing it twice, but I saw the end at the bottom of that slide. Boy, I was headed down the aisle. <laughs> it's ready. We're ready to go. Thank you, Norm. <laughs> so good to have uh, this number out. Uh, obviously, I am not Jesse. Uh, we definitely miss Brother Jesse. Uh, we're thankful that he has the opportunity to be able to uh, to go to other places, and uh, we, we get to share him. And uh, he is spending some time in Lubbock, Texas. He'll be there through Wednesday, so let's continue to pray for his efforts. Remember the family um, as they uh, remain with us. It's good to have the spirits with us. Uh, obviously, we're all excited about Harper and looking for the opportunity to, to meet her. Um, Robert uh, had texted this morning, and, and it's, it's as you would expect with a newborn. There's not a lot of sleep that's, uh, that's going on. Uh, plus, there's a lot of allergies that are uh, bothering him as well. But uh, let's continue to remember them. We're, we're very blessed with a beautiful day. Uh, yesterday was a beautiful day. I love the springtime. Uh, but there's a whole lot of sniffling and a whole lot of sneezing that comes along with that too. A lot of yellow pollen that's out there. But I'm very thankful to be able to, to stand before you this morning and uh, proclaim a message from, from God's Word. You know, the Scriptures are rich with truth, obviously, because they are truth, but they're rich with, with lessons for us to be learned. We uh, can read about so many different characters and, and stories in the Bible that are so meaningful uh, to us, and we oftentimes focus on some of what I would call the primary characters, and I think that when we do that, we might miss maybe some smaller stories that are kind of uh, overshadowed by these, these uh, larger characters or these bigger stories that you might say. Brother Jude read for us the healing of Naaman, the leper, and I believe that that's a beloved story that, that we're all very familiar with and something that we can learn great lessons from about faith, about obedience, many other lessons that I think we can glean from the story of Naaman. The fact that he was an outsider, he wasn't an Israelite, how uh, Elisha handled him, how God handled the situation. There are many lessons for us to, to be learned there. But I think oftentimes, once we get to where Naaman is cleansed, maybe we'll go just a little bit farther where he offers these gifts to Elisha and Elisha refuses. But at that point, typically, the story ends. Whether it's maybe a Bible class or maybe even a sermon from the pulpit, that we get to that point and that, that's, the, that's the sermon. You know, I was telling Brother Todd, I don't know that I have ever heard a, a, a sermon. I'm 41 years old. I know that's hard to believe. And I'm sure there are some sermons that I don't remember uh, growing up, but I don't ever remember hearing a sermon preached after Naaman was cleansed. And I think in this particular situation, if we stop the story there, we miss quite a bit. You see, there's another story in the shadow that occurs directly after Naaman's healing, which I really would like for us to consider this morning. You know, among the less prominent characters of, of scriptures, actually, if you are looking up at the screen, uh, I could probably take a poll if you even recognize that name. I would say many of us probably don't even recognize the name that we see before us. And he is definitely one of the, uh, the less prominent characters of scriptures. But this was Elisha's servant. So there are a couple of different pronunciations. You can pronounce it uh, Gehazi or Gehazi. Uh, I'm going to stick with Gehazi because for whatever reason that's stuck in my mind. Uh, so that's what we're going to try to stick with. But either one of those will do. But this is Elisha's servant. So actually this is like Elisha was to Elijah. So this is Elisha's servant. And if you think about the situation of uh, uh, of what he's surrounded by, being the servant of Elisha, this great teacher of righteousness. And you can imagine uh, Gehazi being there whenever Elisha is saying his prayers and maybe even joining in with Elisha in these prayers. The miracles that he witnessed at the hands of Elisha, the teachings that no doubt he had to have known because he was right there. And it's even possible, we know how Elisha took the spot of Elijah, 
Gehazi very well may have been taking the, the spot of Elisha someday. And despite all of this, Gehazi was able to resist everything. So Brother Jude read for us the first part of the story. And somebody had mentioned the other uh, day in a lesson, uh, Paul Harvey, the rest of the story. So we're going to pick up in 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to read the rest of the story. So it's not going to be up on the screen, so if you would be turning over to 2 Kings chapter 5, we'll be picking up in verse 15. It says, when he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so please take a present from your servant now. So again, Naaman's just been cleansed of this awful disease. And he's coming back now because he wants to give a gift to Elisha. Verse 16, but he said, As the Lord lives, this is Elisha, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. Naaman said, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules' load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offerings, nor will he sacrifice to other gods but to the Lord. In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant. When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, then I bow myself in the house of Ramon. When I bow myself in the house of Ramon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. He said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him some distance. Here we go. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, thought, Behold, my master has spared this name in the Aramean by not receiving from his hands what he brought. As the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw one running after him, he came down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? He said, All is well, my master. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, just now two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of clothes. Naaman said, Be pleased to take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of clothes and gave them to two of his servants, and they carried them before him. When he came to the hill, he took them from their hand and deposited them in the house, and he sent the men away, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? He said, Your servant went nowhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you? When the man turned from his chariot to meet you, is it a time to receive money and a, to receive clothes and olive groves and vineyards and sheep and oxen and male and female servants? Therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and to your descendants forever. So he went out from his presence, a leper, as white as snow. So what happened after Naaman was cleansed? You know, I, I do think that it is interesting just thinking about Naaman and the, the change of heart and the change of attitude that we see just in Naaman. Uh, even with verse 15 there, we, we obviously recognize that his flesh was changed, but I believe that his heart was transformed that day as well. You know, he went from being so proud that he was not going to dip in the dirty Jordan River to going out of his way to thank Elisha, to bring Elisha this gift. You know, I think it's also interesting in, in verse 11 from what Brother Jude read, Naaman said, Behold, I thought, I, I thought that this is what was going to happen whenever I came to be healed. See, he had, he had these, these preconceived ideas of what he thought should take place. But notice what it says there in verse 15. But behold now, I know that there is no God but the God of Israel. And so for what had happened, he offers Elisha this gift. And I had read somewhere that the amount of treasure that Naaman had brought in today's terms would be about, be about five and a half million dollars rather large treasure that he's going to, to offer to Elisha just for the fact of being cleansed. And, of course, we know that although Naaman continues to, to push for Elisha to take it, Elisha's not going to, to take it. All Elisha was concerned with was that God was glorified. 
So Naaman, of course, so, all right, you're not going to accept my gift. If you're not going to accept my gift, please at least allow me to take some soil back with me. This has got to be some holy soil. Now, we recognize that this was definitely not necessary, that there was nothing inherently special or holy about the soil that was in Israel. But I think that, it, again, it does show that his heart is at least in the right place. Again, showing this transformation. Verse 18, I think we recognize there's a little bit of a problem that Naaman still has. He owns up to the fact that he should not be bowing down to, to this false god, Ramon, but that he cannot otherwise not do it if he's going to be able to keep his position with the king. And he explains that his bowing, it's, it's not to honor the idol. I recognize that God is the only true and living God, so that I'm not bowing down before him to worship this God, but I'm doing it really to please the king. And perhaps, all things considered, this might be some kind of apology, but it's still wrong. So Naaman came back, tries to give Elisha this treasure to thank him. Elisha refuses, so Naaman goes on his way. And then steps Gehazi. You see, Gehazi, he had witnessed Elisha refusing this great treasure. And no doubt, Gehazi knew what this was worth. Gehazi says, I cannot allow this. Elisha, he may have refused this, not me. Somebody's got to take something from this guy. It shows the selfish nature of of Gehazi, how self-centered he, he was. This whole situation, what's in it for me? What's best for me? Sounds like a common cry today, doesn't it? We put ourselves over devotion to God, over our service to God. You know, we see the same thing with the story of Lot, how he chose the better land because it was best for him. It was best for his herds. And he ignored the trouble of being so close to sin. Now, I, I want to notice just a couple of things from, from this here. It, it's interesting because Gehazi uses the exact same words, the strong oath words about taking this treasure as Elisha had done about not taking it. As the Lord lives. Elisha was adamant, I am not taking this. As the Lord lives. Well, Gehazi was pretty adamant about taking it. As the Lord lives lives and he didn't just say you know what I'll catch up to him eventually no dude took off I'm going to run after him I'm going to get this the college kids will be familiar with this but we all recognize the the seven things that are abomination to God one of the things if you remember feet that are swift in running to evil that's Gehazi well he was on it that's Proverbs 6 and verse 18 so Gehazi's running after him. Naaman, he, he recognizes somebody is running after him, and he's obviously concerned now, so he steps down. Is everything okay? What's going on? So Gehazi approaches Naaman. Everything's fine. It's fine, but you won't believe what has happened. I mean, like as soon as you left, you won't believe what's happened. I know that Elisha said he's not going to take anything from you, but we just had some visitors. And they could really use a little something. You know, I think it's also interesting that Gehazi didn't go and, and ask for all of it. Go ahead and just give, get all of it. No, he just asked just for a little bit. And I don't know if that was because he didn't want to seem too suspicious, but he asked just for a little bit. You know, this is another thing that is an abomination to the Lord. Back from Proverbs chapter 6. Beginning in verse 16 there, it says, There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven which are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. Notice the next one. A heart that devises wicked plans. Well, Gehazi, he had it, he had it uh, developed in his mind. He already had it laid out what he was going to do. Again, feet that run rapidly to evil. He was full of some abominations. 
You know, Gehazi had asked just for a talent and a couple of changes of clothes in, in Naaman. I, I think he's kind of pleased that I can actually give something. You no, know, don't take one talent, take two. And not only that, I'll send my guys back with you to help you carry it. I had read that the two talents and the changes of clothes in today's money would be about $57,000. So still a rather large sum of money that Gehazi is taking here. <clears throat> and I can just see Gehazi, whenever he's asking for this, that Naaman's like, well, let me send my guys back with you. And he's probably, the wheels are turning. Oh, man, I didn't plan for this. What am I going to do about this now? So they're headed back. They reached a certain spot. And Gehazi's like, I'll take it from here. I got it. He goes and puts the silver and the treasure in the house. Obviously, we see a great amount of greed from Gehazi. And I think of Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. Then he said to them, Beware and be on your guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does life consist of his possessions. Gehazi didn't understand that. So Gehazi's got the treasure now hidden in his house. He goes back before Elisha. Gehazi, where you been? You know what happens when you tell one lie? Most times you've got to keep telling lies to cover up for the original lie. What do you mean, where have I been? I've been right here. I'm not in go anywhere. What have you been doing, Gehazi? Been right here. Ain't nothing going on. Verse 26, Elisha, again, he said, did, not, did my spirit not go with you? Was my heart not with you when you went? Elisha's telling him, Gehazi, I was there. Now, I think we've all been in that situation, and we can feel... Probably what Gehazi is feeling right now. Busted. You see, Gehazi thought he had committed the perfect crime. I, I, I'm going to be scot-free. I've worked this out so well. And instead, he takes Naaman's money, and he also ends up with Naaman's leprosy. Now, I hope that just with the reading of this, you can probably already think about some things that are, are good lessons to, to, to learn. But I want to look at five things in particular that, that I get out of the story of Gehazi. The first one, Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. We know you reap what you sow. Go ahead and turn over to Galatians chapter 6. You know, this is one of those things that... Uh, uh, We've talked before about the law of unintended consequences. It's like Gehazi didn't really think all of this through. Didn't think about the consequences that were going to come from his actions. He was, he was so caught up in the moment, he didn't realize what was going to happen. The fact that he was going to ultimately reap what he sowed. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Isn't Gehazi a great example of this very thing? What kinds of things did Gehazi sow and reap? Uh, another way that you might think about it is what, what did Gehazi exchange one for the other? Well, he exchanged a life of health for one of unimaginable, a horrible disease. He exchanged an honorable position of service as Elisha's servant, the man of God, for an association now with outcasts. A life of stability to now a life of wondering what's going to happen. He exchanged security and the hope associated with living as a servant of God for hopelessness and despair. You know, I, we, we read this, and I think that, that we look at it and we're like, whew, man, that's horrible. I can't believe he did that. And yet, we oftentimes do the exact same thing. 
young people. They exchange integrity. They exchange morality. They exchange possibly even their future for a backseat sexual rendezvous. And life is never the same again. You reap what you sow. Christian men, including preachers and elders and deacons, exchange the entire foundation of the marital relationship, the marital trust, for a few minutes with pornography. You reap what you sow. Christian women exchange their good reputation for gossip. They exchange their good influence for the fashion of possibly a low neckline. Or they exchange their virtue for a miniskirt. You reap what you sow. Christians in general, we exchange time in the, the worship assemblies for some inconsequential sport. Or we exchange unlimited potential of service to God for complete laziness and, and complacency. We will reap what we sow. Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 18. It says, The wicked earns deceptive wages, but he who sows righteousness gets a true reward. He who is steadfast in righteousness will attain to life, and he who pursues evil will bring about his own death. How true is that? You reap what you sow. Something else I want us to see from Gehazi, and this is something that has been more on my mind because of the, the Bible class that we've been doing downstairs uh, with the college kids, but everyone is equally deserving of God's mercy. And you know how deserving we are? We're all equally deserving because we don't deserve it. We turn over to Romans chapter 9. So Paul is talking to the Roman Christians, and th there's a huge problem with the, the Jewish Christians not really understanding or wanting the Gentiles to receive what they have received. Look, we're God's people. We're the special people. They don't deserve mercy. They don't deserve God's grace. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 14, it says, What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. You know, after Naaman had traveled a distance back to, to Syria, Gehazi, again, he, 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 he recognizes that, okay, this doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem right. My master has spared this Naaman, the Aramean, the Syrian. He's let him off way too easy. He's let him off the hook. I'm going to run and take something from him because something needs to be taken from him. This is a guy that has, has been so evil to, to Israel. He doesn't even deserve any kind of mercy. And we just cleansed He was just cleansed? You know, I think it's important that we listen to the motivation that's being exposed really in the heart of Gehazi. He just doesn't like the fact that Naaman the Syrian has been spared. You know, I think what's revealed in Gehazi is a common problem that is revealed throughout the scriptures in the hearts of many. You know, he's upset that the Syrian commander, he's not paid a price for, for what he's done to, to Israel in general, and he's not paid anything for the fact that he was just cleansed. Turn over to Jonah chapter 3. You know, there are several so stories throughout scriptures that I, th I think all are, are the, uh, kind of, of, the, of the same tone that we see here with Gehazi, that we see with the, the Jewish Christians in Rome. But what was Jonah's problem? In Jonah chapter 3, beginning in verse 10, we recognize that Jonah doesn't like how God is handling the Assyrians, who are a terrible and wicked people. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? 
Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. I cannot believe that you just let them free. Let them go. Just kill me now. Jonah, you see what he's really upset about? He's upset about the merciful nature of God. He didn't want these people to repent. That's why I'm not going to go preach to them because I know how you are. You know, Jesus told two parables that made the same point. The parable of the lost things. Jesus talks about the lost son, the prodigal son. How he had gone and wasted his father's inheritance and frivolous, reckless living. And when the lost son, when the prodigal son finally returns, how did the older brother handle it? He was angry and completely refused to go to the party in celebration of the fact that the lost son has come home. And he points these things out to his father, how he had devoured your inheritance on prostitutes. And yet here you are, you've killed the fatted calf. How can you receive him back with what he has done? You know, the issue is that these people are taking the place of God. And they're saying that that person or this group of people, what they've done is unforgivable. They're not deserving of your mercy. Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners, and the Jewish leaders, they grumble about it. Jesus goes to the house of Zacchaeus, and the crowds grumble because he's the chief tax collector. Gehazi thinks that Naaman needs to pay up. Jonah thinks that the Assyrians, they need to pay, they need to be judged. So do we do this? Do we think that we need to make someone pay for what they've done? Do you make your spouse pay with your anger when they sin against you? Do you make your coworkers pay whenever they mistreat you? Do we think that we need to not let people off the hook for things that they may do. How do we look at sinners? How do we look at people who harm us, who wrong us? Who we look at and we think, God, how have they failed you? So horrible. Do we expect them to be worthy of, of our forgiveness too? Our kindness? Or are we at the forefront of mercy, reaching out to them with hope, as God does? We have to understand that God truly does not want any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. You know, this is truly seen in 2 Kings chapter 5. Naaman, the idolatrous Syrian, commander receives mercy. While Gehazi, the Israelite servant of Elisha, receives judgment. You know, this is the, the point that Jesus is making over in Luke chapter 4 and verse 20, 27, a passage where Naaman is actually brought up. He says, There were many lepers in Israel, but none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. In regards to this, this passage, Adam Clark notes in his commentary, he said, God dispenses his benefits when, where, and to whom he pleases. No person can complain of his conduct in these respects because no person deserves any good from his hand. God never punishes any but those who deserve it, but he blesses incessantly those who deserve it not. We can't play God. That's not our responsibility. Another one. It's impossible to be around, let me stop that, it's not impossible. It is possible to be around the people of God and to engage in the work of God while having a heart that is far from God. And I hope that this is one that's pretty easy to see. 
Again, it is possible to be around the people of God and to engage in the work of God while having a heart that is far from God. Sitting right here in this pew this morning does not make you righteous. You can associate with godly people. You can even engage in godly works. While all along your heart is corrupt. And so far from God. It doesn't matter how close you are to his people. Again, think about who Gehazi is serving. Elisha, the prophet of God. And all along he was a deceiver. He was a liar. What about Judas Iscariot? Judas, associated with the Lord did that make him righteous? Did that make him holy? Judas was one of the apostles. You know, I think sometimes we are just trying to satisfy our own consciences. And we tell ourselves, well, at least we're here every Sunday, we're here every Wednesday, we're with our brethren. You know what, at least I'm a member of the Lord's church. Okay? But how's your heart? Now, I am not at all suggesting that we should not hang around Christians. All right? That's pretty important. We know that. We recognize that evil companionship corrupts good morals. We had a couple of classes on this with the, the college kids about our friends and, and hanging around those that are Christians. But just because you hang around Christians does not make you righteous. Turn over to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, beginning in verse 7, it says, You hypocrites, rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. How's your heart? That's what matters. Proverbs 4.23 says, Watch over your heart with all diligence. Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Another lesson that I hope is pretty obvious, sin has a way of finding us out. There's no such thing as the perfect crime. It doesn't exist. Because although you may be clear in the eyes of men, God knows. Sin finds us out. It will be exposed. You know, Cain killed Abel. Was there anybody around? Nobody's going to find out, right? Nobody else is there. Wrong. God knew. What about Achan? When he took of the accursed things and he, he hid them in his tent, nobody's going to know, right? Nobody knew. Wrong. God knew. What about Ananias and Sapphira? Well, nobody's going to know that we kept back part of the money. We're actually doing a lot of good by giving some of it. Nobody's going to know that we kept back part of it. Wrong. God knew. You know, whenever the children of Israel were coming into the promised land, if you remember the tribes of Reuben and Gad, they wanted to hang out on the east side. Look, this looks pretty good. How about we just stay here? Made Moses pretty upset. But they finally agreed, I'll, I'll let you stay, but first you've got to come and help us fight the people that are in the promised land. And he says in Numbers chapter 32, verse 23, But if you will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. That's pretty scary. I can just see Moses saying that to the people. I'm just going to tell you. Just, just be certain. Your sin will find you out. Maybe we need to tell our kids that. Maybe we need to tell ourselves that. 
You know, there are many ways that men imagine their sins to be hidden from God, but I can tell you none of them are successful. Careful concealment of our sins cannot hide them from the Lord. We cannot hide our sins by refusing to admit them. Just because you don't admit it doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't mean that God doesn't know. You know, some people think because of a sin that they committed, it was so long ago. You know what? Time, time has washed my sin away. No. Time doesn't wash away our sins. And I don't care how many good deeds we've done since then. Good deeds do not wash away our sins. God sees and knows every wicked deed we commit, every evil word that we say, and every sinful purpose that we conceive in our hearts. You know, we're told in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Your sins will find you out. Finally, again, another one that I hope is pretty obvious for us to see, the God who heals the trusting also punishes the erring. If you will bow down before God with a trusting heart, guess what? He's going to lift you up. He will bless you. He will protect you. You know, we, we see such, this, uh, such a, a transition from, from Naaman and how proud he was in the beginning. Psh, I'm not going to go wash in the Jordan, the dirty Jordan. What? I don't understand why I have to go wash in the jewel. I'm not going to do that. But eventually, thanks to the words of his servant, Naaman humbled himself. He trusted in what he needed to do, and his heart was cleansed. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23, A man's pride will bring him low, but a humble spirit will obtain honor. You know, we often think of James 4 and verse 10, uh, if we humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, that we will be exalted. But back up to verse 6, James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Naaman was shown some grace because he stopped being proud and had some humility. But you see, the God that showed mercy and gave grace to Naaman is the exact same God that is going to give justice to Gehazi. You know, when Gehazi tried to deceive and to lie, again, our one lie just kind of led to another. He was punished. He took Naaman's money, but again, he also took Naaman's leprosy. Again, from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, pride goes before destruction. And you know, if Naaman hadn't have changed, he would have continued in his leprosy. And here we got Gehazi. Oh, I, I, I'm deserving of something. And he is definitely not deserving of anything. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. It is better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Oh, Gehazi's thinking, I've got all of this treasure now. Now just to leave a life of leprosy. You know, Gehazi gave up his place as a servant to a prophet of God. He gave up his possible position to, to one day taking over for Elisha. He gave up so much for so little. What was Gehazi profited? Though he gained those two talents of silver and those two changes of clothes, he lost his health, he lost his honor, he lost his peace, his service, and if he never repented, he lost his soul. Remember Elisha's question to Gehazi, 2 Kings 5, 25. But he went in and stood before his master, and Elisha said to him, Where have you been, Gehazi? God is asking you now, where have you been? What have you been up to? Now, I hope that you can honestly say, nowhere. I've not been up to anything. But if not, know this. God already knows the answer. And God's given you this time right now to come clean. And if you don't come clean now, 
God will explain to you in the day of judgment how he was right there with you. And you will receive your punishment. You know, we talk about the, the different lessons that we can learn from, from Naaman and the fact that how Naaman's pride originally stood between him and, and cleansing by dipping in the Jordan. Well, what's standing in your way right now of the cleansing waters of baptism? 2 Kings 5, 13, Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean. If you were told that you're going to be able to receive eternal life, but you've got to go climb Mount Everest, how many of us would be at the base of Mount Everest right now? If we were told to do some great thing to obtain eternal salvation, we would probably do it. And yet we're told to dip in the waters of baptism. And for some reason that causes a hiccup. Wash and be clean. Make the decision right now to wash and be clean. You can if you have heard the gospel of Christ. You can do that if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. If you are willing to repent of your sins. If you are willing to confess that Jesus Christ is God's Son, is your Savior. And yes, if you are willing to, to dip in the waters of baptism. Have you made the decision to be a disciple? If not, why not? Make that decision today. Have you followed after Christ and have you sinned? If so, ask for forgiveness. Repent of those things today. If we can assist you in your service to God, please come forward as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.